in a remote cabin in the high Sierras. That rabbit stew smells delicious, Snake Eyes. I just wish I hadn't seen you sneak behind them and break their necks. We have a visitor. Oh, it's one of Timber's progeny, bearing a gift or maintaining a pact created years ago. Take them, Snake Eyes. Scarlet, I want to tell you. Shh, not now. Doesn't seem to matter what I say. I'm always turned away. No one knows how hard I tried. Oh, I, I have these words that I need to say. Driving me insane. All my life been so silent, but I'll vocalize tonight. Cause I'm just snake eyes and I've been born again. Is it my destiny to live a life of mute ninja agility? I'm quite zen, but when I want to talk, it ends. What will it take for her to see the man behind the clone and speak with me? It's me, Mark, and thank you to Snake Eyes for that lovely little introduction to the episode. My love language is G.I. Joe, and welcome to Talking Joe, the G.I. Joe comics podcast. If you are new to the show, you can find out all of the details over at the website, talkingjoe.co.uk is that website. Today, we will be looking at G.I. Joe a Real American Hero, issue 303, released 17th of January 2024, which was uh, just this week gone, as at the time of recording. And today we, we will be joined by some special guests, the hosts of the Comic Book Couples Counselling Podcast. But before we bring those on, joining me as always, his love language is nitpicking. It's A Real American Tim. How are you, Tim? Hello, Mark. I'm well, and hello, listeners. I have no pun response to that <laughs> intro. Okay. Uh, I, I, my love language might be providing community for my friends. Mm. Uh, let's say hello to our guests. So our special guests are, well, one of them makes up approximately 50% of the Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast, and the other one makes up the remaining 50% of the Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast. It is Brad and Lisa Gullickson. Hello! Welcome. Hello! What accurate math! There's no 200% of Comic Book Couples Counseling here. There's exactly 100% and no more. <laughs> See, I said, I said approximately because uh, I guess as you you might in your own minds have different definitions. But let's oh, let's not get man. into that. Let's not no, create. No, 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 no. Let's not create a uh, a whole. <laughs> no, we had to be lying down in this conversation about GI Joe. <laughs> So, uh, so, so, yeah. The, the the reason that I sort of brought you on was on the back of uh, well, being a, a listener and fan of your your podcast. But then all of your coverage of the Skybound relaunch made me think that you'd be great to 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 bring on and, and bring on very different takes on on GI Joe as as well. Because yeah, you've been you've been getting into the weeds with the. Uh, Energy on Universe coverage. You've been looking at the books. You've been talking to to the creators, and and so on. But yeah, your mileage in terms of uh, GI Joe as a whole does vary. So, Brad and Lisa, why don't you tell us about your GI Joe origins stories? Uh, where does it stretch back to for you guys? So, Lisa, I think I'll start that since seems... I am older. Yeah, that seems fair. That seems <laughs> okay. fair. You go ahead. All right. Uh, so I'm an 80s, 90s kid. Um, I was trying to figure out exactly when I started collecting G.I. Joe action figures. And I just this very day went and looked at all the early waves of the three inch, uh, three fourths line. And I've determined that 1984 was the year I first got the toys, uh, because I remember that line fairly well. Uh, so if it wasn't 84, then it was 85, and I somehow still got the 84 line. That's that's what I that that's I think approximately where 
I began my obsession with G.I. Joe. And it was an obsession. I loved the cartoons. I loved the toys. I loved the G.I. Joe animated movie when it came out. And in 1990, we moved from San Diego, California to Burke, Virginia. And I hated it. I hated Virginia at the time. I hated moving. I hated my school. I had no friends. But my dad took me to Joe Gumbinger's uh, Burke Used Books and Comics, and I saw my first G.I. Joe comic book, and it was issue 103 with Storm Shadow crashing through the ceiling, sword Mm. raised. And uh, that was my first comic book. And so I owe my obsession with comics to my obsession with G.I. Joe. Wow. And my story with G.I. Joe is like way shorter because I am a (laughs) slightly younger 80s, 90s kid. And weirdly, G.I. Joe never came up. I have an older brother. He was into juggling and klutz books. Do you remember those from the 80s (laughs) where like it's just like you buy the book and they teach you how to how to juggle? That's what he was into. So how um, to use a yo-yo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had Yo-Yo. They had all kinds of fun fun books that my brother was super into. So, um, yeah, we were not an action figure house. and um, You were I, a pretty conservative house. Like, yeah. You, you know, toy guns wasn't really, like, your thing. Although your dad was a hunter. We were allowed to have toy guns. Okay. What we weren't allowed to do was watch a ton of TV and stuff like that. So, um, not, into, not into G.I. Joe. My introduction to... All of that stuff is through the Energon universe. Like my my creativity for GI Joe, like was not peaked until I started reading the Energon universe, and I realized that I actually had some like really off off target preconceived notions about what GI Joe was. <laughs> I had no idea. Like we we just watched the eighties movie. Yeah, 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 with uh, Galobulus, Galobulus, and, and Cobra Law, and I was like. This is way trippier than I anticipated. I I thought that like GI Joe was like way more literal about like oh it's a it's a TV show about the U.S. military and it is not that at all. It is um high fantasy. Uh, I don't know science fiction. Yeah, science, science fiction, fiction plays a big part in the GI Joe. Yeah, for wild, sure. wild. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So so Lisa, your your experience of of G.I. Joe is, I guess, basically, at the moment, three comic books. Duke 1, Cobra Commander 1, and G.I. Joe 303. Um, Yeah, so reading G.I. Joe 303, I was really, really dependent on those context clues. And I'm just going like, Brad, what does this mean? And Brad's like, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Because that's the thing, right? Like, I was really into the Marvel G.I. Joe comics, but I don't even think I made it all the way to issue 155 of the Marvel run back in the day. And at the, you know, so I'm missing, you know, 160 issues worth of continuity. So when I picked up issue 300, when Skybound uh, joined the party, uh, I was like, there's a female snake eyes, it looks like. Oh, uh, <laughs> what's going on here? At the same time, I also felt like issue 300 wasn't too complicated. And I I had such a great time with it that uh, I was like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. I can read some Wikipedia entries as well. Sure, cool. why not? <laughs> Just to fact check, you're talking about 301, Skybound's first. Yeah, sorry, issue. sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, another and- preconceived notion that I had about the G.I. Joe is from, like, the meme of, like, G.I. Joe's, like, at the end of every episode of the television show, I guess. Yeah, the they would PSAs. Have, like, yeah, they would have, like, this kind of, like, moral of the story. So I was anticipating, like, something a little bit more moralistic. <laughs> and um, and uh, I don't know. I Like, I'm going to have to really search for my takeaways from this issue number 303. I, I don't know what I've learned about myself <laughs> from, from this issue. <laughs> The TV show continuity and the comic book continuity are different. Yes. This isn't like Star Wars where it's all one story. Yes. So yeah, Brad, I just I kind of assumed that um that you you'd kind of uh, covered the the kept up as as you were going along, but so you even you've got a, a bit of a a oh, yeah. gap there. But um, it's I mean it's interesting, sort of back in the day, um, particularly you know in the eighties and and so on, when we were sort of getting into to comics, you would just 
pick up with a random issue to, you know, like GIJ 104, like you mentioned earlier. And, and you sort of just have to, you know, get all all of the context clues, figure things out, um, have the mystery of everything that came before as as just a, a little bit of a as a puzzle puzzle to unpick. And and uh, yeah, that's the how how it how it used to work before the days of resetting with a brand new issue one and brand new starting point every few issues. Um, yeah, so I, I guess Giojo is a rare that. exception. I I miss that because you know you know it might take a few issues, but you'll get there, mm-hmm. and uh, like that's. That was my experience with, you know, the Amazing Spider-Man or Captain America or Ninja Turtles at the time. Uh, And then that would then propel you into the back issue bins and Mm. starting to catch up that way. And and I I still have strong nostalgic feelings for operating uh, with comics uh, in such a fashion. I feel like children, though, are are also more comfortable with not knowing. Yeah, because they're Mm. stupid. Right, right. Well, because <laughs> they were just barely born. Like, you were 10. Yeah. And so you you were really accustomed to not knowing what the hell is going on. I right? had just learned what a snake was. And so... I was like, oh, snake eyes. Got it. <laughs> Putting it together. And, and I tried to, to enter comics. I tried to recapture that childlike sense of wonder when I enter a new story. But it is, as an adult, it is hard to go like, well, I don't get it. I'm putting it down. And I, and I, and I tried to, to um, kind of stifle that adult knee-jerk reaction i want to i want to enter it with the mind and open heart of a child one of one of the things that i think about in the modern world where um with dvd box sets and streaming everyone is aware of seasons in a way that when i was a kid we were not like you knew that there were new episodes of a show the new season would start in september but you weren't really concerned about if this one episode was season three or season five of your favorite sitcom. And I remember being really a, somewhat aware when G.I. Joe or DuckTales was running in the afternoons. And one week there might be like one of the two-parters or miniseries. And then later in the week or the next week, there'd be episodes that had originally aired before or after that. And the the syndicates were airing out of order you know like when you watched reruns of different strokes or three's company or mash they were running them out of order and with a show like lost or now sort of every single show we all watch them in order Mm -hmm. and my first issue of gi joe was you know issue 90 and a bunch of stuff had happened and i had no idea and that issue had a bunch of footnotes in it which referred to other issues so I, I like this idea that kids or when we were younger or when the sort of structure of how to take in our entertainment was less um, precise, we all just sort of winged it. And like, I, you know, I read an issue of G.I. Joe and it refers to someone dying in a previous issue. And sooner or later, I got that issue at a convention or a store or a mail order. And in the back of my mind, I must have remembered that that was the issue where someone dies, but it's still a surprise. And you don't have that kind of serendipity when you are only watching your show in order, when you're only reading, you know, I, I won't I won't read the five new issues because I missed an issue. I'm going to wait till the, the collection comes out. or I'm going to wait till my friend mails me the one issue I'm missing and then I can catch up. And in the last couple of years, one or two other monthlies that I like, but I don't that I'm not as worried about having an amazing reading experience. Occasionally I have sort of misplaced an issue because I've got piles of comics around, uh, like Firepower, this wonderful Robert Kirkman comic. Oh, yeah. We love so Firepower. Good. Okay, so just randomly like I was reading issue 24 and I thought, oh, the, the dragon seems to be further along. And then a week later I found issue 23 in a pile like yeah. next to my bed. <laughs> and I thought, Oh, I, I brought this home in a stack of comics, and I forgot to read it. So I like I read two issues out of order, and it didn't like ruin my day, and it didn't like betray my fandom against uh, Skybound. It was just sort of like being ten again, and you don't know if the spinner rack at the Seven Eleven is going to have the new issue. Yeah, mm-hmm. I love that. I love everything you've just said, and that experience of going like, oh. 
I didn't read issue 23, but I can just pick up 24. I'm trying to embrace that now because I am the type of reader who will let his to read pile of floppies build, 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 build. And then I become overwhelmed and I'm, I'm trying to shed that overwhelmness by just going, well, okay. So I've missed four issues of let's say firepower since you brought it up, but I never would because that comic's so good. How dare you miss an issue? Uh, <laughs> Let's say I've missed a few issues of that. I'll just pick it up and, you know, I'll I'll, uh, go back and read them if I find them. Yeah. I bought a ton of the free comic book day issue one of Firepower for my store. So I am a good Firepower fan. (laughs) (laughs) He doesn't want to doesn't want to damage his Firepower cred there. Um, (laughs) Let's let's just cover some any other business from last episode briefly. On the Facebook group, there was a retrospective uh, error for 302 that was noticed, which was that one of the Joes had the name badge Welker, and Frank Welker was the sh- voice of Short Fuse, which is one of the Joes. So I think probably what has happened there is that a bit of Google Foo has sort of said, what is the real name of Short Fuse for the uniform? And they've got the name of the voice actor who, who portrayed him rather than his file name. You know why that's okay? Why is that, Tim? Because um, in issue, uh, what was it? Two, was it 277? Uh, the issue with G.I. Joe, that's the spotlight on law. Mm -hmm. this is just from four years ago uh law is in that issue he's not identified by his toy file name he's identified by the hasbro employee whose likeness was sculpted onto the figure and we thought that was a weird mistake and then uh friend of the show diana davis on facebook creative consultant uh sort of continuity cop on the comic uh said something like maybe that mistake was done on purpose (laughs) <laughs> well, no, prized it essentially, but uh, in in his next appear subsequent appearance, he did have the uh, the rec- more recognisable name. And there was also in the in the, here we go in the right in the guts of things. Um, Rob over on GI Joe Berg noticed that in the flashback to Vietnam, uh, Storm Shadow had some swords on his back, which is not part of his normal look back then in the day. He did have a bow and arrow, but not uh, swords. So. Yeah, I think we can noblize this one again. The, this is maybe the, the narrator's unreliable memory, sort of conjuring up his picture of how he might remember it rather than how it actually came about. And, and also maybe just a bit of artistic interpretation, which I give leeway to. Every time an artist has, has redrawn redraw, this sort of period, it's looked slightly different. Um, so this is kind of in keeping with that. And then the the other thing was just in a bit of news. 302 is getting a reprint, which is great news because it's sort of showing that the book is doing well, well enough to warrant another reprint. And we're getting a cover from Danny Earls, who's sort of a great uh, emerging talent over the last uh, couple of years, sort of making um, some, some big waves. And I actually reached out to him to ask him about the process of doing that cover. So he was kind enough to send us a little message, which I'll play now. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks a million for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm delighted to leave that note here on the cover. I mean, what an honor it was to work on a, a franchise like G.I. Joe. It's, it's incredible. I'm so grateful for that opportunity. I think G.I. Joe, even if someone doesn't know comic books or toys or the franchise, they know what G.I. Joe is. <laughs> <laughs> so like to work on such an iconic franchise is it was amazing i really wanted to put my heart and soul into that cover and i kind of went for a different uh style of cover jerry joe's action packed and it's kind of in your face and it's intense and it's awesome but i went for a more kind of quiet subdued tone right before the action might kick off i mean i, I feel like any other cover would have probably happened three seconds after the image that i chose in my cover snake eyes bursting through the windows um of the cobra headquarters but i ch- kind of chose the quieter scene leading up to that. I wanted to, sh- to give the the landscape of what I thought a Cobra uh, headquarters might look like up in the snowy mountains and Snake Eyes is able to find it. So, yeah, to draw uh, anything in that universe, it, it, I'm absolutely honoured. That's all I can kind of say. I hope to work on it again in the future. The fact that it's it's hitting so so hard now, if, like the artists have Chris Mooney Ham and obviously on Duke as well. You have Tom Riley, the writers they have on it. I mean, it's it's amazing. So I couldn't be more honoured, excited, and just absolutely chuffed to work on that cover. Thanks for having me, guys. 
thanks there to Danny Earls for giving us that message all about the second print cover to 302, which features a striking image of Snake Eyes descending down the outside of a Cobra HQ uh, as seen through the window with a couple of Cobra Troopers on guard, none the wiser. Uh, I saw a couple of comments suggesting that possibly there might be an homage to issue 21 silent interlude with the snake eyes just repelling down uh, i think that's probably more coincidental than anything else uh worth probably noting that uh danny is actually an irish footballer as well as artist he was scouted and signed as a teenager to premier league side aston villa played football for the republic of ireland and had a nine-year professional career in the USA before doing a career left turn and becoming a professional comic book artist and doing very well at it. Um, so, Joe Admin, uh, done. Uh, let's let's get into things. I just following up on that that opening uh, song <laughs> and generously calling it a song. Let's just talk Scarlet and Snake Eyes a little bit. I have been sort of ruminating and thinking about uh, their relationship, and this plays a little bit into the issue that we've we've read that that twice now. Snake Eyes have been, has been shut down in issue 300. Scarlet said to him, shh, don't say another word. And uh, in 302, shh, not now. So the expression is once is happenstance, twice is a coincidence, three times is a pattern. So I guess we're on coincidence now, but in my mind, we're forming a, a pattern. And <laughs> my thoughts are, it, it could be three main things. One, you don't need to talk. I already know what you're going to say. Two, enough talking, more kissing, or or three, the snake eyes I fell in love with didn't talk. If you talk, <laughs> you're shattering the illusion that you are the same person and not a crazy freak clone in the really mixed up relationship that we've somehow ended up in. Um, as as the as the relationship experts, if if not necessarily <laughs> the GI Joe uh, law from the last few hundred issues. Did you have? Did you have guys sort of have ideas, thoughts about this relationship that that Scarlet has got with a the clone Snake Eyes? I love Snake Eyes and Scarlet together, and I I did have that feeling reading the previous two issues of like, okay, uh, you know, what is the deal here? But then we get to this issue, and you know. The, the the kissy kissy has already happened and <laughs> the the fighting begins and i loved the action sequence and i love seeing these two just decimate uh some fools together uh, and chris mm. mooneyham illustrates that sequence so beautifully i just want good for them you know i you know of <laughs> course we're comic book well. couples counseling so we're hoping for some serious snake eyes and scarlet content but we don't really have much here, but we have the promise of it. I hope mm. that that promise is eventually delivered with some actual, you know, kissy, kissy, romance, romance, relationship, relationship <laughs> content. I see a lot of like they do truly share their lives because they have Timber. And in this scene, Timber answers to both Snake Eyes and Scarlet, which I think like shows a balance in their relationship. Yeah, they're good dog parents or wolf um, parents. But, you know, it is hard to get that, like, work-life balance when you're a couple who works together. And, and you're constantly being attacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, if you're a G.I. Joe, it's really hard to, you know, leave work at work and, you know, deepen your connection with your partner. Hmm. I don't want to get too far into the detail of the, the issue itself, but but what you're saying does sort of prompt a question to me that we can, let's let's talk about this maybe once we get into the into the middle of the issue itself but that that and opening that's that scene they they are lying in bed together but they are you know back to back which as a shorthand maybe points to to uh possibly some some uh, something maybe not quite right but then when they're attacked it's they're on an autopilot and it, it maybe it's that combat situation that is is the more comfortable environment for them to relate to each other as a couple and maybe the more coupley stuff particularly given the new dynamics of snake eyes as a returned clone is is maybe the more troublesome stuff but 
Uh, let's talk about who brought this fine issue to us. It was delivered by writer Larry Hammer, artist Chris Mooneyham, colorist Francesco Segala, uh, with uh, Flatter uh, also credited, which is nice, Sabrina Del Grosso, letterer Pat Brusso, and editor and Alex Antoni, publication design Gillian Crabb, creative consultant Diana Davis. Let's have a look at the covers in the gallery. The cover to 303 is penciled ink by Andy Kubert and colored by Brad Anderson. And this is Serpentor Khan. Um, the camera, it's, it, there's no background. There's just flame behind him. He's holding his cape with his right hand. And his fist is out and up, uh, a little up and past you, uh, his left his left hand, his left arm. And he's looking up and past you, and his mouth is open. There's a little bit of uh, contrapposto to his pose. Though he is just standing there, this is a really active cover because his pose is not uh, flat and symmetrical. The two snakes that make up his collar are alive, and they are hissing. Uh, and they are not at the same uh, altitude. A.D. Kubert uh, drops the two bottom fangs from Serpentor's mask, but I guess in the interiors, Chris Mooneyham has as well. Serpentor Rex here is the zombie, so his uh, skin is green and has boils on it. So in that way, he sort of matches the snakes. Brad Anderson uh, does a gorgeous job um, with red reflected light on the bottom of Serpentor Khan's pecs, uh, his six-pack, sort of underside of the of the arm that's thrust out um, under and, and on some of the sides of these two snakes. This cover, this is what I was talking about in our last episode about how some upcoming covers, so the last two covers focused on Joes and vehicles. And this cover focuses on villains or villain and no vehicles and no background. Um, but it, you know, I think a cover should ask a question and the comic should answer it. And I think that comes from Stephen Grant. I didn't invent that. But when I read that in a column of his, I thought, yeah, so maybe I'd always had the, uh, the unfocused inkling. This cover does not ask a question, but you can occasionally just draw a badass hero or villain. <laughs> and that's enough to get someone in a store seeing this on the shelf to pick it up and say, well, this looks cool. Okay, what is so exciting about this cover is how bold it is. And and I just want to compare this to a bunch of covers that were published during the IDW run on the book where it was a character or two, uh, maybe just standing there or maybe kind of standing there with their weapons drawn, looking out at you. And those covers were uh, less exciting and less dynamic and... Andy Kubert is a cover artist. He's also a great interior artist. There are comics artists who can draw covers, but maybe shouldn't because their stuff is is uh, a little tepid. And Andy Kubert is a cover artist. He draws bold and exciting covers. Interestingly here, the camera is at waist height and is looking slightly up at Serpenter. That's part of why this cover is uh, so exciting. Uh, cover B is a black and white version of this, just Kubert's inks and no color. Uh, it is still bold and exciting. And uh, if you have both of them in front of you or JPEGs of both, it's fun to do a little back and forth comparison to see how much dimension Brad Anderson is adding in the color because Kubert adds only, draws only three or four lines to indicate where the flame is. And uh, Anderson creates a lot more depth in the background. Cover C is the one in 10 incentive cover drawn by Brad Walker and colored by series colorist uh, Sagala. And as with the previous two, it is one Joe in the foreground attacking the full body and one Cobra in the background, head and shoulders, not physically there, but montageishly there, looming over the scene. Uh, in this case, it's Scarlet, and she's jumping. She's lunging with both arms outward, and she's firing her uh, crossbow. Behind her, it's Dr. Mindbender. 
foreground is all in red tones, and it, I, that's not just because of the fire, right? Look at the gray on her legs. That's not a normal gray, that's a warm gray. It's not a neutral gray. And then the background is all cool, so purples and blues. So that's how foreground and background um, get separated. Mindbender, actually like cover A. Mindbender is higher than us. We're looking up at him. He's looking down at us. Brad Walker draws such a great Dr. Mindbender because he's cartooning just a little bit, like 10%. The eyes, the mustache, the mouth, right? Brad Walker draws, quote, realistically. He's not a cartoony artist, but there's just a little bit of, of exaggeration in here. And you get the sense that this isn't just any person with a mustache and a monocle, that this is Dr. Mindbender specifically. Uh, this is a wonderful, exciting cover. And uh, as with the previous two, if you're going to do a cover, the previous two, one in 10 variants, if you're going to do a cover where it's, quote, just a hero looking cool or firing their weapon and just a villain in the, uh, in the background, this is the way to do it. Right. And then we've got a continuation of the Mike Mayhew retailer exclusives via direct from uh, Mike Mayhew, this time spotlighting Lady J um, in a very similar cover to to one that, that actually appeared in the IDW run. Let's move on to a plot breakdown to summarise what this story is all about. Plot Breakdown. Alpha 001 arrives on Cobra Island to give Serpent Khan a proposition to upgrade his mutant army to enhanced cyborg weaponry. A demonstration is given to show an upgraded Blue Ninja against a casino bot BAT. Bat. The upgraded Blue Ninja deploys shields to deflect the missiles and make short work of the Bat with its energy sabers. A Viper is then the first test subject to be transformed adding a lifelike shell so that he can pass for human. In Utah at Camp Greer, the Joes see the Serpent or Revanche collaboration and Duke our spirit to put the pit on full defensive alert. He will ramp up from giving 100% to 200% effort. Later, Spirit spies three cybernetically enhanced Vipers snooping at the base's perimeter. In Springfield, Dawn Moreno visits her parents to let them know she is fine. And in the High Sierras, an enhanced Blue Ninja kill squad is sent to take out Snake Eyes and Scarlet. A noise disturbs their slumber, and they disappear into the eaves of the cabin when the Blue Ninjas enter. The Blue Ninjas are taken down by sword, throwing stars, crossbow bolts, and a burrowed energy saber. The remaining cyborg sets Kamikaze Destructo mode, Serpentor Alpha 1 and Mindbender, get a brief transmission of video which seems to show Snake Eyes, Scarlet and Timber dead on the cabin floor. Dun dun dun! So let's get into the detail. Let's start with uh, saying something nice. Uh, let's go. Brad and Lisa, do you want to pull out one thing first that, that you liked about this issue? Well, we've already talked briefly about the Scarlet and Snake Eyes sequence. I think that sequence is exceptional. I think the illustration of the uh, fight is great. Um, I, I think Chris Mooneyham overall is a magnificent addition to the G.I. Joe canvas. And one of the reasons why I was so excited for Skybound to get a hold of this franchise. Excellent. I'm impressed with how dense this issue is. Like, clearly there are a lot of moving parts in these stories. And I feel like each story has its opportunity to move forward and create more drama. And they do a really good job of saying everybody's name. Like, <laughs> when I, because, I, you know, I'm coming fully in medias res. I have no idea what the hell is going on. But... They take the time to say everybody's name. So I at least know who every single person is. And even if it's not a person, you know that like, okay, this is a viper. This is a bat. This is a blue ninja. Right. That, that was briefly confusing because sometimes I was like, oh, did the G.I. Joes call them one thing and the Cobra people call them another thing? So I, it took a little bit of like, you know, I had to turn my brain gears a little bit. But, but I feel like they do a really good job of going like, hey, if you missed issue 302... <laughs> This is who everybody is. 
that's that's a really interesting observation because one of my observations was that there seemed to be less naming of characters than there normally is. I mean, it's something that Larry Hammer always makes a point of in his script of of naming characters, so you're absolutely aware of who who everyone is. But like on that uh, sort of GI Joe sequence, particularly, there's a good few Joes that they don't need to be named because you can completely follow the the story without it. But there's a Stalker. Dial tone, mainframe, and then later on, Lady J. And I don't think any yeah, of those. Yeah, no, I had to ask uh, who that was. I was like, "Does Scarlet have short hair?" And he's like, "Definitely no." And I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> okay, t- Tim. My positive thing is going to be the two-page scene in Springfield where hmm. uh, Dawn is reunited with her parents. Everything about this scene, every panel. The story logic of it that was set up in a previous issue that uh, Dawn was introduced way back in uh, the 220s, I think, maybe the early 230s, as uh, a as a citizen of Springfield and uh, like a high school member, was it the Cobra Youth Brigade? Alan spotted at the Cobra lacrosse tryouts. <laughs> right. Thank you. This scene is well-written, well-staged well-drawn, well-dialogued, and uh, that final word balloon, right? Mm. When when Dawn says, Dawn, Dawn and her parents are hugging, and she says, I know you're not going to turn me in. And her mom says, we would never turn you in, sweetheart. And her dad says, never in a million years. And she looks at the camera, and she says, I know. Mm. Which makes me think, oh, they might turn her in. Or, no, Hama is actually not cynical about a character like this, and she is saying that assuredly. And either way, it's it's good drama. I get the sense, like, from that panel with no context <laughs> other than the, the few panels, like that uh, Dawn is counting on her not being turned on in because she is up to no good. Mm. Right? Like, right? Yeah, to I, me, I, I find that panel to be menace ominous. There. Yeah, yeah. Ominous. That's an even better word. Like she's going to go plant a bomb or something? <laughs> she, I, I, don't, I have no idea, but, but she's, like, she's like, I'm counting on my parents to hide me. Because I'm I'm about to do something that is terrible. Or at least against Springfield. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of pages earlier, Duke sort of sets it up fairly subtly as saying that he's gonna put a sneak and peek team into Springfield. So I think Dawn is part of that that team. So it's she's like a sneak and or peek. Yeah. So her parents might be acting kind of in good faith and, and not gonna turn in Dawn, but but Dawn might be getting up to to mischief on the Joe's behalf in, in Springfield with the both sneaking and peeking. Okay. Mark, what is your uh, starting out one good thing about the issue? I, th- I think it's probably the the art generally. It's it, there's a lot of heft to it, and it and I think it elevates the the book. But uh, specifically, I really liked the the bat versus the revanche. That this is the casino bat versus the revanche robot sequence, and you've got that kind of that shook panel where where it gets sort of cut in in half and and that whole sort of sequence just put me in mind of some of those kind of films with kind of very artful um you know cinematography like you know crouching tiger hidden dragon that that kind of thing with the you know the falling leaves uh, all of that kind of good stuff it's um it yeah it kind of looks a lot more artful than <laughs> it probably deserves this sequence uh lisa since this is your first issue of A Real American Hero, and and maybe maybe you're already a step ahead because you asked Brad a bunch of questions, but <laughs> um, not not for us to answer, but so you can remind us of the point of view of someone who's brand new to this. What are your questions, having now read this issue? Um, hmm, what are my questions? Like, to me, in this issue, there is a lot of progress on many fronts but i don't know what those fronts are like at all um like when i read a comic i'm of like a very character focused individual and like to me when i read a comic i want to know the characters a little bit better like i have no idea what like what don's loyalties are how she feels being a high school student who seems to be thrust into the middle of a really high stakes situation. I'm just curious about everybody's feelings. Like, um, like, is everyone okay? You know, it does everybody feel 
like they have autonomy do you, do they feel satisfied by being part of what they're being like um from your point of view what is the plot yeah what's oh, the bigger what plot my, of this i comic? haven't i haven't the foggiest idea <laughs> well so you have like serpenter on cobra island he's yes talking to this AI type group. They're making like a collaboration. Yeah. So like they, so like to me, there seems to be some kind of like, like, um, it's like not a cold war because they're fighting all of the time, (laughs) but like, there seems to be this kind of pressure that everybody scale up. You know what I mean? Like where it's just like, we've got zombies, we've got cybernetic zombies, but can (laughs) we make them robot? fully more robot cybernetic zombies where I feel like they've, they, they all feel this pressure to continuously scale up. And like, um, I, I'm impressed at the level of surveillance the GI Joes have, and they really seem pretty pleased to just kind of sit back and watch right now. I don't know. What is the plot? No idea. It's, it's a good point. But have I ever cared about plot? Like I, I feel like I don't actually care what the plot is. I, I care care more about the who than the why. It's interesting you're saying this, and I'm not going to answer all of those questions. But Larry Hama, who writes this comic, has said in interviews or when he posts online, when he consumes a story, movies, TV, books, he is not interested in plot. He's interested in character. Ah. And pretty regularly in the last five years. People are talking about the new It show on streaming, and he'll say, I watched a couple episodes. I don't like any of the characters. I'm not going to continue. Or he would say, I'm not concerned about if the plot here is is sort of working or not. It's the characters that are carrying it for me. There are also shows where he says, you know, the story's amazing and the characters are amazing. Uh, Brad... So you have read uh, three issues of this current current series. Yes. You've also read 40 or 50 issues way back. Yes. What are your questions? Well, you know, the you know, like the issue 301, you know, ends with the mutagen bomb going off. And we have obviously, uh, uh, you know, Cobra Commander's got his things going on and Serpentor Khan has his things going on. And so the vi- there's so much villainy that is shattered and uh, each one wants to be, you know, on top. And so they're kind of having like a civil war right now. Okay. And G.I. Joe is trying to figure out, well, how do we combat or do we even bother to combat? Do we just sit back and let these various fractions eat themselves? Mm, literally. That's my understanding <laughs> of what's going on. Now, Don Marino, uh, I know, is the female Snake Eyes. And I, as of this issue, I now understand has ties to Springfield okay. and Cobra. Because Lisa Springfield is like where Cobra does its thing. Okay. Okay. So is it so like that's it's like a like little Nazi Cobra country suburbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So all of those people, like Marino's family, well, the Marino family might actually be bad. I well, bad guys? they're complicit in what Springfield's up to. Oh my. You know, they're like any other American. Like yeah. they're complicit to <laughs> they're, what America's up to. They're just like paying HOA dues and going like, whatever happens, happens. Hey, I got a pool. <laughs> Do you know what I like? My most legitimate question is, and you're not going to be able to answer it, but like, what does Serpentor Khan look like when he gets up in the morning? You know what I mean? Because <laughs> is he, he sleeping in that snake suit? Yeah, is he like, like clearly to me the unitard thing looks comfortable, you know? <laughs> and I imagine that he has like one of those foam heads that he puts his. He but these snakes thing. are alive. alive, yeah. But they're really short, right? Because you don't see the rest of their body, like, because I like do. Do you think it's like a, like a venom symbiote? I have no like. Are they attached in the back? Are they? Is it, is it a two sided snake? Like I don't ever remember seeing Serpentor Khan out of the costume. Yeah, uh, out of the the skin the snake's skin suit. But then also, if you look at his ends, the ends of his hair. 
Like, clearly, he's doing some kind of, like, he has some face framing layers. We see that. But, like, does he do, like, but the ends of his hair are, like, curled in. Like, <laughs> yeah. does he have one of those, like, Dyson, like, air blower things? Or does he sleep in those, like, where you wrap your hair around a thing? And we're we're going to have to consult the experts curls? on their podcast. But, like, <laughs> like, what does he look like naked? Uh, well, we we have seen him naked because he was cloned recently. And okay, he came out of he came out of the tank naked, so he looks yeah, like. Yeah. So, Ging- did he have snakes on him? No, no, no. He looks like Genghis Khan. Okay. Because he's Genghis Khan. Okay. Yeah. And then he puts on this uniform. Then he puts on the uniform, and then are the snakes in like a terrarium? The well, do they sleep with him? The snakes are kind of like how artists draw Batman's cape. Oh, it's, okay. It's all artistic license. Uh huh. I think if you look at the original toy design. You would argue that it's it's just like a fabric part of the costume. Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, in the TV show, they don't animate because that costume is really difficult to animate already. In the animated movie, you might remember, uh, there is one or two shots where the snakes do move as if they're alive. Uh-huh. But I think artists are just having fun and we're not meant to think too hard about what's happening uh, behind Serpentor Khan's I neck. I wonder if it's like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, where like you know you could tell like her emotions or what she, or what she was going to decide based on like the the necklace that she was wearing. Like you know she had her like I I'm dissenting kind of necklace thing. I wonder if it's like that where he puts on his angry snakes when he's in an angry mood, and he puts on his chill snakes <laughs> when he's like today it's a chill day for me, Serpentor. That was a comparison I was not expecting. I think every day is an angry day for Serpentor Khan. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's like a mood ring. <laughs> but we've not seen him. We've not seen him naked since he turned into a a, a zombie. So mm. uh, it's he's probably yeah. So I'm going to ask uh... each character what they look like naked, <laughs> and I expect a really straightforward answer. <laughs> Actually, that that is a good point, and sort of answers Lisa's question. I think now that all these people. Um, at the casino have been turned into zombies. I think they don't take off their clothes to put on pajamas at night. Right. I think they're mm. just wearing these clothes and these clothes all only the time. get dirtier uh, and more torn um, over time. Some of these guys, they've sort of, their limbs have turned into like sort of freaky to ten- tentacles. And there was a, there was a kind of Cthulhu looking zombie in one of the backgrounds. Yeah, that with Viper. Sort of... Oh man, I want that action figure. <laughs> Freaky stuff hanging out his front. Yeah. Here's a point that I want to make. Uh, I'm going to make a larger point about Chris Mooneyham's uh, work on this a little later in the episode. But I am I'm torn because on the one hand, I like how much ink he's using. And I think he's drawing digitally, but I like how much ink he's using and how there is a really nice structure of black and white, of dark and light in the pages. That said... He doesn't seem particularly interested in showing off the costumes of the world of G.I. Joe. And some of that is because there are a lot of close-ups. And some of that is because a lot of characters are in shadow. So, you know, I'm looking at this issue. We have this entirely new character, this blue ninja that we haven't seen before. Uh, These are the ones that walk on on page uh, four right? With that transformation tank. And uh, there's a panel where three of them are approaching. Um, and some of this is Sagala uh, coloring, very dark. And some of this is Hama's plotting, right? I don't think this page calls for necessarily a, a big panel revealing the new revised blue ninjas. But there are three of them walking toward us. All right, And then uh, on the next page, this one of them is involved in a fight. And again, it's drawn very small and far away several times. And then a couple pages later, uh, a viper is transformed, and then you have to wait until later to see what happens, right? So now I'm on this page where I'm getting to my actual uh, point here. We're on this page where it says, in Utah at the front. It's the one where uh, the vipers and the blue ninja are are creeping up on Camp Greer, and Spirit is on the bottom with a white background um, listening, uh, talking into his ear. And again, it's nighttime, and there are a lot of shadows. That makes sense, and this is how Mooneyham draws. But those are two Cobra Vipers and a Blue Ninja, and Mooneyham is is not interested or is not available, some of this might be plotting, to show me these costumes. Like, I don't get to enjoy 
what the zombie Cobra characters look like because they're very small. They're behind something. They're in shadow. And Mm. part of the thrill for me of every G.I. Joe story, because I love how the characters look and I think of Joe's as color combinations, you know, like shipwreck, like white, light blue, dark blue, you know, like this is not this is not like a flashy image book from 1993 where there are a lot of like pinup pages where like a character is just standing there like saying something threatening or they like show up and the artist gets to draw a page that really acts like a cover with no background. This is not that. But there are the like, cool new characters here or cool variations of characters. And it's like I can't really tell, you know, like which of the background Cobra characters are like regular Cobra soldiers, which are Vipers. And I'm going to pin a lot of this on Mooneyham in his storytelling and in his uh, sort of inking and shading. I was just going to say, there's a description there from the Joes where they talk about spotting them and calling them out as upgraded versions of the Viper, Toxo Viper and Techno Viper. But I've no no idea how the Joes are telling that because it doesn't, there isn't any visual cues that tell you that it's going to be these different types of, of Vipers. Um, so yeah, some some of that kind of design, design, cool design of the different types of uh, Cobra Vipers is is yeah a little bit missing. I don't know. Like for me, I'm in love with what Mooneyham is doing in this series. And as far as like the Blue Ninjas are concerned, I definitely see where Tim is coming from. But I also feel like this book embraces style in a way that the Mm. idw a real american hero series did not where it really embraced design it's like okay this is what a figure looks like it's like flatly colored it's bright but this with like the blue ninjas in like to focus in on them i'm like you get the introduction on page one page two you know it's bat versus blue ninja it is a small figure but i think it is a like a striking figure. And then when we get to the third page of the blue ninja, where the blue ninja slices that bat casino bat in half, that is like a Mike Mignola panel, Mm. that top panel. And it is mostly in shadow, but I find it to be bad ass. And then when we turn the page and we see the Cthulhu Viper, very tiny on that middle panel, It is small. It is not a splash page. But in that smallness, there is still like incredible detail. And I'm reading it on an iPad. And when you zoom in on those uh, Cthulhu Vipers, like I think they look incredible for as tiny as they as they are. And then when we do get the action sequence with Snake Eyes, Scarlet and the Blue Ninjas, uh, they look amazing. Like I I love them. You don't get body shots, but those torso shots, those interesting camera angles that we're getting, to me, it all just screams action and movement. And I, I get enough of the design where I can I can piece together what the toy is. But I do see what Tim is saying, where we get a pretty good shot of the costume behind Duke on this screen. Like it's not like it's not like high on page detail. 13. It's not like high detail, but you do get a you do get a good a, I, th- I think a fairly good look at it. But that's like a completely different set of priorities than my priorities. Like I don't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just um uh, to me I'm just like ah oh, robot guy boom. Like, like I just get like if, if I find out oh in his past life his name is Steve and he had a husband and a child then I then I'm like <laughs> what does this costume look like? You know, you know like when we were in Vegas we did find a copy of. Uh, G.I. Joe 300, the, yeah. the last IDW issue. Yeah. And we had 300 and 301 opened up together. And like, no disrespect to the IDW team. And the IDW team, are like, you know, they also hired, you know, like Michelle Fife to do like his own series. And they got Tom Scioli to do that Transformer series. And I adored the art that was going on there. But I just look at A Real American Hero 300. And then I look at Skybound's American, Re- uh, American he- Real American Hero 301. And like, this is where I want to live. I want to live in texture, shadow, and and vibe and style. I think this might be a good transition to my other major comment. But before I talk for three minutes, Mark, do you want to jump in? <laughs> yeah, I was going to note while we were on that page in the pit with the Blue Ninja on the, on the screen, 
the world that we often live in is sort of looking at that page and going, well, that's that's Lady J there, but she's been coloured with pink hair, short pink hair. And when we see a character who's got short pink hair, that's normally Zorana. So so potentially room for confusion there. But um, I do like the I do like the mood of the the colouring, even if poss- possibly you sort of pause for a microsecond and go, hold on, who's who is that character? But yeah, there's a there's a definite. I think Tim's about to move on to this. There's a definite kind of move to to sort of the focusing on the art and the the style and, and maybe less on the, the the simplicity and clarity of the the storytelling and and the the pages here are more more one that you could take as a page on its own and buy that page and hang it on your wall because you know there's a lot of grit and mood and a lot of texture and the characters are sort of uh, one point perspective looking at us the in in, in the audience and uh, generally, each one of these pages looks pretty cool in isolation as an individual piece of art separate from the whole, which is probably not something you could necessarily say about most of the, the IDW run where a page in isolation, you know, you're not going to necessarily, it, it, it's not going to be as exciting in itself other than servicing the, um, the story, even if it is well put together and, and clear to follow and all that kind of good stuff. Okay. I had strong feelings about this issue, and they were so strong, I sent an email. I sent a Ooh. letter to Postbox the Pit. Fired. And I just want to, so I want to start out by saying Chris Mooneyham draws well. His faces, his shadows, his textures. Brad is absolutely right. There is so much texture and shadow and style and, and verve and mood in not just this issue, but these three issues. And a lot of G.I. Joe during the Marvel era was what I would consider, and this 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 is an imprecise and unfair title, but I would consider Marvel House style of the 1980s. There are 15 artists working at Marvel in the 80s, some of whom drew G.I. Joe and others who don't, who all draw on this very reliable, clear, uh, attractive uh, uh, style, right? These are not like Bill Sienkiewicz. These are not, you know, Arthur Adams. These are not those guys. And final third of the Marvel run, the book starts to get a little bit of some different influences, right? Like Andrew Wildman and Phil Gogier are looking at different things. The IDW run, two thirds of it are drawn by one guy. And his storytelling is crystal clear. And his his penciling doesn't have this Chris Mooneyham amount of style and texture and shadow and and oomph and and uh, verve. But Shannon Gallant's storytelling, his character acting, his poses, his fight choreography, where people are in a space, how they're moving from one place to another, how they're acting and interacting and reacting to each other. In the IDW run, it's great. And what I always wanted was like a really, really heavy sort of stylist finisher, like like a Klaus Janssen to not just ink, but like really ink on top of uh, those pencils. Okay, what's happening with Chris Mooneyham is that he doesn't draw three-point perspective or two-point perspective. He only draws one-point perspective and optical perspective. One and two and three point perspective, right? The full term is linear perspective, linear as in lines. And if you think of diagonal lines, if you're uh, in a kitchen looking at a uh, linoleum floor, or you're in a school or hospital and you're looking at the ceiling and there are those rectangular ceiling panels, right? And you look down the hall, all those diagonal lines converge on a point, either at the wall at the end or like in the distance past where you can see. Optical perspective is just arranging overlapping things in front of other things and making things bigger and smaller to create a sense of depth. So uh, an, an example of that would be page three of this new issue of G.I. Joe, uh, the first panel where Alpha One, uh, Alpha Zero Zero One is talking to Serpentorcon. Um, there's no linear perspective here. There are no diagonal lines which show that like a wall or a ceiling or a floor or buildings or like objects are like diminishing in space as they move away from the camera. 
Mooneyham draws some things bigger and some things smaller, and he draws some things in front of and behind other things. And that creates depth, and that's fine. But flip back to page one. First panel. This is one-point perspective. And you can see the diagonal lines on the floor, right? They all converge on a point that's uh, actually about um, lined up with um, Mainframe's chair sitting seated at that console. But the wall with this computer monitor, we are perpendicular to it. And that's what one point perspective is. Mm -hmm. If you are staring straight down a hallway or straight at a wall or straight at a side of a building, you're not looking left or right, you're not looking up and down. That's one point perspective. And there is so much of this comic that is only one point perspective. And Mooneyham almost never draws two point and he doesn't draw three point. And two point would be if you are like looking down that hall or looking at a building and you turn your head a little bit to the left or the right. And three point would be if you tilt your head a little bit up or a lot up or down, right? Think of like Superman comics where Superman's flying uh, through a city and we're looking down at a bunch of buildings or we're looking up at like Daredevil or Batman swinging through some buildings. All those diagonal lines on the edges of buildings and for the windows, right? There's none of that here. Now, there are artists in comics who pull this off really well. Mike Mignola is one example. Think of all of his Hellboy comics. Mignola never draws linear perspective, but he also is writing his comics, and so he gets to put them in places like dungeons and like uh, fields, countrysides, um, catacombs, and he's such a visual stylist, you, you don't need it. And he is constructing a story so that like Hellboy can just be in a cave and you draw a couple curly lines and a bunch of black. It's like, well, words, he's, he's in a cave, right? What I see Mooneyham doing here is really limited, and it's making the storytelling and my enjoyment of the story much less, because I keep seeing the same panel over and over and over. So page one, panel one, straight on shot. Page two, panel two, straight on shot. Page three, panels three and four and five, straight on shot. Panel four, uh, page four, panel one, and two and three, straight on shot, right? Mooneyham is not moving the camera around enough. He's not fine tuning it. He's moving it around a lot, but we're always perpendicular with the thing we're looking at. And there are so many like close ups of Serpentor Khan's face that it gets like distracting. And I think Mooney, so it, this gets better later in the issue, right? The two page scene with Dawn uh, and her family, good. Uh, the fight with, Scarlet and uh, Snake Eyes, good. But I'm seeing a lot of limitations in Mooneyham's storytelling, and they haven't gotten better over the three issues. And this guy went to the Kubert school. So I think he needs to work from someone else's layouts. And that's where I land. I think he draws well. I think he doesn't story tell well. I think, I think your knowledge of perspective is ruining your good time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I feel like I do have a different set of priorities when I'm looking at Mooneyham's art. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Mark? You think it where to go from, from Tim's De Debbie Downer? Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll say something nice. Um, okay. It, I mean, Brad, Brad made this point. It is so incredible to be reading not just this issue, but now the third issue, where there is so much delicious tasty like eyeball delightful visual style right yeah, like, but I, like, like the way i would describe it is it's style it's vibe it's mood it's also emotion and i get a lot more emotion in these three issues than i've than i have in the few times that i have picked up er, the earlier uh, idw stuff now, now you make excellent points i definitely see what you're saying it doesn't bother me as much as it bothers you. And and maybe it is a trade-off. But I also feel like when he does, in the back half of the issue, he does switch perspective up enough in the action sequences for me to, you know, freaking enjoy them. And in a lot of the uh, panels that you're talking about, there is a lot of dialogue happening where, like, I feel like the inf informationally it's a little bit more dense than in the fight scene in the bedroom of snake eyes and scarlet for example where he does get a little bit more dynamic with with his perspective 
here's my final sort of note on this. And I think this offers some proof that there's a that there's a there's an issue with Mooneyham's drawing this book. On the third to last page, the ninja attacking Snake Eyes says, Irk, he's twisting the blade. And then on the next page, it says, The edge is facing up now. And the other one who's on its shoulders says, To what end? And then Snake Eyes says, The better to slice upwards through both your bodies, which he then does. And if characters are telling me what's happening, that means the art is not showing me what's happening. Well, I agree with that, but I feel like you can take those word balloons out and the page is perfectly fine. Um, this reminds me of this thing in like 60s comics where uh, there's a narration box and it's like spider man swinging through the city and spider man swinging through the city and spider Man's thinking, I'm swinging through the city. It's like, I know, I <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, and you get it on the first page of this book where it's like, what are we looking at here, Stalker? And Stalker's like, well, it's a helicopter and we have a helicopter on the screen. And is that an artist's problem or is that a writer's problem? I think what's happening on the third to last page and the second to last page is that, I'm going to use a film term here, Mooneyham didn't pick the right camera angles. I need another panel which shows like a close up of either Snake Eyes' hands holding the sword where it's very clear that it's the blade edge up, or if there's like three small panels in a row where he's like twisting the sword or he like tosses the sword and then grabs it at, from the other orientation. I think the first page, I, I don't think that's Hama overcompensating for unclear storytelling. I think that's a first page bringing you into the story. Because Hama is not writing for a graphic novel collection. He's writing for a monthly comic. But the this bit with the sword on the end is like a blinking red light for me. Like, oh, Mooningham, you, you didn't get this right. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, you know, uh, fair enough. But I, I feel like I feel like he did. Like, for, yeah. for my taste, he, he did and uh, continues to do so. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's what it comes down to is like you know, what might be an issue for one reader is not necessarily an issue for another reader. Where, like, a problem might be a problem for you, but it's not necessarily a problem for Brad or myself. Fair enough. Uh, this is not uh, this is not specific to this this issue, but Hama has said a few times before that sometimes he has to write additional dialogue to make clear something that an artist on a book doesn't make clear in the visual storytelling. Mark, where do you land on this? Tying into the kind of this last scene, the I was overall a little bit disappointed by the the issue. And the main reason for that is nothing <laughs> about any of the points we've spoken about thus far, beyond beyond seeing a lot of like people looking directly into the camera at one point perspective and thinking, oh no, Tim's going to be talking about this again for half an hour next episode. But <laughs> um, but it was it was more the focus on this Blue Ninjas and and this will probably be less of a, a thing for Brad having missed a lot of the IDW issues. But a big focus of that IDW period was kind of that Blue Ninja uh, revanche subplot where there was a, just a familiar routine of revanche developing a bigger and badder version of the blue ninja and this is the baddest yet and then they send it off to send it off into battle and the first one is a big boss villain and it's almost impossible to to beat but then next time around there's 20 of them and they take them down no trouble at all so i just feel like with this issue we're falling back a little bit into the old patterns of that that um revanche blue ninja storyline kind of feeling very much like deja vu uh they've sent in in this final sequence they've sent the blue ninjas after uh, snake eyes and scarlet and in previous issues they sent the blue ninjas after the arashikage ninjas in their water tower in the yearbook and there was a, a, another similar sequence uh, back in issue 215, 216, where Snake Eyes and Scarlet, well, this was Throwdown Snake version of Snake Eyes, fighting off the ninjas that were attacking the, the cabin and pretending to be dead. And then in the subsequent issue, they were uh, um, Snake Eyes was disguised as uh, what they call Night Creeper and then revealed himself to Cobra Commander that he hadn't been defeated. He'd snuck in to teach him a lesson. Um 
so yeah, it was a little bit falling back into to kind of plot points that we've seen an awful lot of bef- before, and I'm kind of I was just kind of hoping for for a little bit more of the new and a little bit less of um, Blue Ninjas. I had the same reaction. Mark made this point, which is when the Blue Ninjas were introduced like 70 issues ago, they were described as unbeatable. And when they attacked some Joes initially, uh, the Joes had a really hard time taking them out. They were armored. They're also ninjas, right? They're not just Cobra bats. They're, they're not just robots. They're ninja robots. And, and so Joe sort of figured out like, okay, well, if you shoot it like in the head and then the next time the blue ninjas showed up, in theory, they were just as hard or harder to defeat, but the Joes managed to do it. And then the next time, the next time, it just sort of in in storytelling got easier. And I keep thinking, no, it should be it should be harder. And if they started out sort of on a scale of 10, like they're a nine. That's how hard they are to destroy. And then, you know, 30 issues later, they were a 10. It's like, well, now they're a 13 out of 10, but Snake Eyes and Scarlet, uh, you know, this, this fight does look uh, hard earned, but... And I don't want the Blue Ninjas to show up and actually kill Snake Eyes and Scarlet and Timber. But every time we go back to the Blue Ninjas, they're actually just as hard or easy or easier to defeat. And and I, I, I need something new to happen with that. Like either they go away or it's like revealed that there's some weakness. Like, that, like oh, the Joes um, put a computer virus and on a scale of one to 10, all the Blue, ninja, blue Ninjas are back to a five in terms of difficulty. Because there was the the casino bot bats that was defeated in the beginning of this issue, and when that was introduced, that was the biggest, baddest new version of kind of the the Blue Ninja iteration. And in the issue they were introduced, the two of the you know baddest GI Joe agents were kind of fought to a almost standstill to defeat one of those, and then the next time they appeared, they were they were very much treated like cannon fodder. So it, it kind of felt a little bit similar to that with this one where they, this new iteration is the biggest baddest and defeats the previous biggest baddest but then when it comes to fighting snake eyes they're they're able to take down however many it is here six ish without without breaking too much of a sweat albeit that they definitely die at the end and uh, that will be the end of them for sure no more snake eyes and stuff <laughs> i have a question and i can't believe i didn't think about this before but like what are they actually fighting over? Like, what's the actual conflict between the GI Joe and the Cobra? It's not such a silly question, Lisa. It's a, quite a perceptive thing to be asking. For most of the last run, it, it is kind of an answer, a question that hasn't fully been answered. A lot oh, of the okay. time, it falls it falls back into a kind of uh, a trope of the Cobras want to fight the joes and that's kind of almost the end goal without sort okay. of thinking what is the next stage be beyond that so that but they have springfield do they want to create a whole bunch of springfields do they want to turn is that is that their idea like cobra cobra commander uh who's not in this issue is a disaffected american domestic terrorist okay in the backstory of, you know, a story that's told that takes place before issue one, before he founds Cobra. And then he slowly builds up this paramilitary army and it becomes this global operation. And if you're, if you're letting the the TV show sort of infiltrate, it's like, oh, well, Cobra wants to take over the world. And in the comic, it's, it's much more political, not like actual politics, but sort of grounded in that Mark, how would you describe this? Like Cobra Commander wants the American order torn down, but uh, he rarely gets very far with that because he gets so caught up in Mm. like sort of the particular like robot or plot of the issue or the five or 10 issues. And, And there are some, there are some like personal vendettas back and forth between a few characters, which A, carry the drama long term but also be sort of distract from the larger goal like right now cobra commander uh in the last issue uh he headed back to springfield because he he thinks it's going to be invaded by uh serpentor khan yeah so at the moment his motivation is i guess more of an existential threat that serpentor khan is gonna uh supplant him 
take over Springfield and eat everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, beyond beyond that, yeah, there is a lot of distraction into the kind of like personal beef, I guess, of, of perhaps trying to go after a specific G.I. Joe-like snake eyes because they do have this long, tangled uh, history. But then often beyond that, it's like, yeah, it's, set, it's sort of setting up his his own kind of dominion of it, like a Cobra Island away from the sort of American government being in charge. Uh, so this whole kind of you know disaffection with kind of that element, and then at, at times as well, it's it's more just an interest in in profit that that maybe he's after you know some money making scheme, but. So he wouldn't necessarily, we don't have a good picture of like how Cobra Commander would run America differently. Like his main conflict is like, I just want to, I just want to be steering the ship and I don't, and I don't want, and I don't want anyone else such as Sir Pendercorn to all, to have that power. Like, so he just wants to be in charge. It doesn't matter how or, mm. or to, to what end. It's not like if someone else was running america the way that he would run america like you'd be like okay well he's got it he's got the right vision there i think cobra commander early on he was trying to convince people with his philosophy there have also been a story or two where he's brainwashing people with a with a machine yeah brainwashing Um, them to think what uh huh mark what's the what's happening in millville i guess it's an unquestioning uh, an unquestioning loyalty to Mm. to cobra but also going in that particular storyline he he was going went into um like a traditional kind of community where uh there used to be like heavy industry and and Mm -hmm. that's all gone and there's like you know unemployment and and you know not the prosperity that, that there used to be and he, he was able to kind of play on that of say you know we're we're here bringing you something different and we're going to bring back jobs and prosperity and all you need to do is consent to being brainwashed and fully loyal to, to cobra and some people are okay with that uh-huh would he then deli- like if if we all agreed to be brainwashed would cobra then deliver on that do you think that he has the means to deliver on that well um back in issue uh 156 157 cobra does take the white house okay and then what um, was the first thing that he did mark i don't remember he got distracted by gi joe i think oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> this I, is I the just thing. would love to see like what's on cobra commander's vision board because i feel like he's like i feel like he's a lost individual i feel like he he like he is an he is someone who needs to revisit what his ideals actually are mhm this this is a good point. Yeah. Um, I think I think this also, I think this actually reflects one of the challenges of this series, uh-huh. which is that there are, you know, three hundred GI Joe and Cobra characters that you know that had toys, mm-hmm. and then another uh, thirty or forty, uh, you know, invented for the series non-player characters like this senator and this doctor scientist and this person's um, partner or spouse. Uh, this random kid who's like an orphan who becomes a ninja. I'm sort of transitioning into one of my other uh, larger points I wanted to make about this issue, which is I think on the one hand, Hama is interested in sort of future threats and where warfare and technology could go. So here we have these AI characters in the form of the Blue Ninja and Alpha 001. That's a really interesting concept as a villain as an antagonist for G.I. Joe and as an antagonist for Cobra or as teaming up with Cobra. And I think Hama runs into the issue which Mark and I mentioned before, which is that um, I feel like maybe not enough has been done with the Blue Ninjas or sort of maybe all that can be done with them has been done. And then I think, you know, there's so many uh, cool Cobra characters who we haven't seen in a while you know, like Major Blood or Scrap Iron or some of the Dreadnoughts, and I'd love to check back in with them. And so I think one of the, I think one of the challenges of writing this book for Larry Hama or anyone writing this book is there are so many characters and you want to focus on a few so that you can tell some drama. Mm. But 
there are all these fans who have other favorite characters. It's like, well, my favorite character is this obscure G.I. Joe vehicle driver from, you know, 1992. When's he going to be in the comic? And then you also have vehicles, which are these really cool, particular looking things that have specific functions. Like you wouldn't have the Arctic vehicle in the desert story. And vehicles are people's favorites. And Hama is really interested in gear uh, you know, he's like owned cars and he like likes to fire guns. And so that also wants to get showcased. You, I, a comparison might be like X-Men, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, like, what's the solution been for the last 20 years with so many X-Men characters? Well, you have nine monthly X-Men books and G.I. Joe generally only has one. And so... You know, we get 20 or 22 pages a month and it's like, cool, Duke got to do something and Snake Eyes got to do something. And oh, we saw Spirit. Spirit said something cool. Um, I, Dial Tone was on page one. I love Dial Tone. Well, he, did, he didn't do anything, but he got to say something. And then, you know, it's another 30 days before I get to check in with, you know, these cool 300 characters and these cool uh, 200 uh, vehicles. So there's there's this really limited um, canvas. Mm. Um I was thinking. I was just thinking while Tim was saying that about more about the guess the the ideology of of Cobra and it kind of it was born out of I guess the the negative about a dissatisfaction with the world around around him that that he didn't you know see himself as getting a fair shake in in terms of you know general makeup of society and specifically anger around the death of his brother which he blamed on. Um, vicariously on on snake eyes so there's these kind of destructive forces around a dissatisfaction and a blaming society and specific individuals for the thing that left him feeling disaffected and and that kind of born out cobra and you know there's been there's been elements sort of where you know there is a clear idea of what he's trying to achieve of build you know his own state you know with cobra island and stuff but um it's more often than not brought down by either a distraction of that that focused anger or uh, you know for for the things that ail him as being gi joe or, or snake eyes specifically and then also i guess the disloyalty around cobra because i guess if there's a there's a theme of cobra and gi joe more broadly it's it's kind of the the loyalty of the the joes that they have to, for for one another and the mm. disloyalty of cobra so there's this constant tussle at the the top and the infighting that they have and the falling out that, that they have between all of those Cobras is is more often than not what sort of brings them down rather than p- perhaps something that, that G.I. Joe is trying to, to do, which is why you've got kind of you know, revanche and, and Serpent or here as kind of, you know, the driving forces against Cobra. Um, and previously we've had the likes of Destro and, and Zartan kind of playing a role in that as as well rather than necessarily it just being a cobra versus gi joe it's it's just as often all of the baddies against one another and then gi joe also <laughs> in that mix i was actually really impressed with serpentor khan being able to trust again in revanche considering like he had been betrayed by them like in the past to the point where like you know like i would think if i had collaborated with someone and then they had betrayed me i would be more wary like to me i i think that shows a tremendous amount of optimism <laughs> on sir pentacon's part that like that he would like where he hates gi joe so much i guess that he would be willing to trust someone else. Like, I don't know. It, it, it kind of like blew my mind. Just that level of like, wh- why you would put your eggs in that basket again. I don't know. Yeah. This time they definitely won't double cross us for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They said no backsies. Yeah. But I mean, like forgiveness is such a, like a tremendously powerful thing. <laughs> And the fact that Sir Pentor Khan could find it within it himself to forgive. So you're, you're admiring getting... Sir Pentor Khan's capacity for forgiveness. No, I'm, I'm, I, I'm 
admiring his capacity, his capacity to believe that everything is going to work out despite it having never worked out in the past. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure, Where sure, like sure. I'm way more defeatist than Sir Pentacon. You know what I mean? And I'm working on a way smaller scale. <laughs> Imagine, Lisa, in your past life, you had been Genghis Khan. Yeah. 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 I think, and he, is I really think like... he actually, I think he's an optimist because he, I think he did such a good job conquering <laughs> in, in a previous century. Uh, no, I'm, I'm saying this. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm saying absolutely. This. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Like that in the grand scheme of things. He's done it before. He's done it before. Yeah. But he must have a tremendous sense of accomplishment then. You know what I mean? Where even if in the second life, it doesn't work out exactly as planned, I've already had this super satisfying first life. I need to find that in myself. Uh, yes, uh, Serpentricon's rex- resurrection. It's all gravy after your resurrection. Right, I, I, I agree. I wanted to pick up on two threads that we, uh, uh, I don't think I've really touched on yet and get, get some reactions. Um, one is... Um, the zombie thing. Mm-hmm. And I know that in the previous issue, there's a moment where there, there's a panel where some zombies on Cobra Island do eat someone. But I feel like um, Hama has sort of forgotten that there are all of these zombies in issue 303 and that zombies only have sort of one thing on their mind and you know if, if you if you make zombies in your story you get to make the rules for what you know are they fast are they slow you take out their head they die how much they want flesh but all the things that mindbender and serpenter Khan are saying and doing in this issue i can imagine them doing if they weren't zombies right no i had that same thought too. the zombie thing is so weird but I kind of love it, right? Like, I, you know, when I picked up 301 and the mutagen bomb went off, I was like, oh, what are we doing? And it, it, it is so extreme. And I am curious to see, like, is does it actually change the course of anything? Right now, it doesn't seem like it is. Well, I mean, like, they already devalue life. Like, they, they've been really... Like, uh, they've really relied on human beings as, like, just can- cannon fodder for, like, a long time. But it also feels but like... I can see, like, going, like, oh, God, I don't, uh, I don't have to deal with the inconvenience of all of those. Like, you don't have to make a zombie believe in your cause. You don't have to worry about, okay, yeah, like, thank God, they do not have hopes and dreams. But they've I touched upon... I can just kind of point them in a direction. In the previous two issues, mm-hmm. that it is a zombie thing where they do crave flesh, but right. now we're getting zombies that are like Cthulhu creatures. Right. So like what what exactly is a zombie zombie in this context? I don't think we have full answers. Well, I think like the fact that it's a mute a mute it wasn't a zombie bomb. It was a mutant. But it bomb. did make zombies. It did make zombies. <laughs> but like the whole point of mutation is that it's like constantly changing. Mm-hmm. So I think that it being a mutant bomb versus a zombie bomb. What I what I see in the comic is they all have uh, like rashes and boils on their skin. Some of them have tentacles and not this issue, but in a previous issue, they they do crave human flesh. And I think when they make it to shore, whether it's Florida, because Cobra Island is off the coast of Florida, mm-hmm. or Springfield, and uh, Lisa, the joke is that the clever thing or the joke is that we actually don't know where Springfield is right. because in, in the real, it's like the Simpsons joke, but this predates it. In the real America, <laughs> There are Springfields in 49 out of 50 states. How fun. And so it's like, oh, where do the Simpsons live? Like, they live in Springfield. It's like, oh, where, where's Cobra Springfield? It's it's in the states. <laughs> um, and so it's not clear if, you know, they're going from, like, Florida to, like, North Carolina or to, like, Oregon. But when these zombies, both the, like, retiree citizens who were at the casino and also the Cobra soldiers, make it to America and Springfield... That does change the story. And maybe in Hama's writing of this scene, these scenes in 303 where they're upgrading uh, the, the the vipers, whether a zombie is hungry for human flesh doesn't need to be addressed because we did that note in the previous issue. Mm-hmm. But I do, in this issue, I did think, oh, have we forgotten that they're also zombies? So that's one point. Mark? Can can I chip in? So, so yeah, like yeah. last issue, you know, Serpentor was kind of unifying that that force on Cobra Island, 
with the promise of going to Springfield as a a bigger food basket, I guess, because they're it, it, stuck on an island at the moment um, with limited things to to kill and eat. Um, so, so you know, very much a unifying, motivating idea of let's go to Springfield and uh, take over Cobra and use that as a launch pad to eat America. I think that plot point hasn't gone away completely because I think they are, they are still are going to do an invasion of Springfield um, before too very long. But but yeah, I think possibly there's been a bit, little bit of a distraction in terms of all of this um, Blue Ninja aspect of now the zombies have been made into cyborgs and they're less motivated by human flesh and more, uh, you know, and, and more up to snooping about bases or, or going on um, hit squad assassination missions. So Brad and Lisa, uh, Larry Hama, when he writes a story, he he doesn't plan ahead and he just writes the next page and he doesn't really know what's going to happen on the final page until he gets there. He he has in his career written some stories and plotted some stories. You know, he's like working in the X-Men office on Wolverine and they would have like yearly meetings, all the writers and the editors, and they'd figure out what would happen the next year because there'd be a crossover. So I think not literally every page, he doesn't know literally what's on the next page. But I think in broad strokes, he really does, as he say, says, make it up as he goes along. So, you know, we're reading 303. When he's writing 303, I don't think he knows what the zombies are going to want or need in 304, when they're going to get to America or Springfield in 304 or 305 or 306. If something may change that, like the Joes head to Cobra Island and stop them, I think when he gets to that scene as he's writing it, he figures it out. So uh, I'm I'm willing for some of the sort of rhythm and the pacing of this subplot to feel uneven because Hama will get around, not he, he won't get around to it, he'll get around to something. Mm. And that's how the book has always been. And I think sometimes that's really fun. Sometimes it's frustrating, but it's always interesting. The other thing that jumped out at me in this issue is... Uh, an, Mark talked about this at the beginning. Snake Eyes talks in this issue. And compared to any other character in a comic book, he doesn't say a lot. But compared to every Snake Eyes appearance ever in this comic, he talks a lot. (laughs) He says, easy timber. He says, I heard it too. And he says, Scarlet. And he says... The better to slice upwards through both your bodies. And then he says, best to make sure. That's a lot. And I felt like something was missing. Uh, And Mark and I talked about this when we finished talking about the previous issue in a previous episode. How is Scarlet going to react to Snake Eyes now talking, now being able to talk? And... I go a step further, which is how might the reader and how might the other Joes react? And I think in the, I think it's two things. In the juggle of so many characters and vehicles and subplots, and also Hama's writing is not melodramatic. It's not highly emotional. Like It's not Chris Claremont's Uncanny X-Men. There aren't these like big speeches where you know like scott and gene like profess their love for each other you know this is not stan lee's silver surfer it's like shakespearean uh tragedy like i've lost my home planet and i am alone sentinel of the spaceways like things happen and most of the characters in this book are u.s military they are even keel they get the job done and uh and sometimes something terrible or amazing happens and they don't react much and they move on. But this scene, I feel like, okay, twice now recently, Snake Eyes has started to say something and then he doesn't and Scarlet's there. And all of a sudden he's talking in this issue, uh, A, like a regular character and B, like someone who sort of has always talked. And I felt like, if not in this issue, then really soon, I think I need more of an acknowledgement from some other Joes that Snake Eyes is A, back from the dead, and B, he can talk, because he could never talk before. So we were under the impression that he could not talk, like he was incapable of talking? Yeah, he suffered two different terrible injuries 
when he was in war and also on an early mission sort of at the beginning of G.I. Joe. But this is a clone of Snake Eyes now. Yes. So maybe that that same trauma has not happened. Correct, correct. So So how long ago did the clone come back? Uh, six issues. Six oh, okay. Issues. So he's fresh. Okay. No, not even that. It's, it was three three uh, hundred that he. Well, no, actually... three three. Okay, he came out of the tank in three hundred. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, is it not common knowledge? Do the do the do the other Joes know that he's a clone? It's common knowledge uh, that he's a clone. They, they would they would now because some of them were there when he shows up, and some of them were on the radio, and someone's like, "Say, hey guys, is here. He's back." Here, he, so Hama doesn't write a lot of emotionally heavy uh, characters emoting a lot. Mm-hmm. He doesn't he doesn't do that. But when Snake Eyes died, his funeral was an entire issue. And so I feel like Hama for consistency, I don't need a whole issue where the new Snake Eyes goes to the base and every Joe comes around and pats him on the back. And then he and Scarlet go have lunch. And she says, I can't believe your voice sounds like it does. I haven't heard you speak, right, in so long. But I need something. Mm. Did, does he have the memories of the old snake eyes, or is he a completely separate, is he a completely new person? Mark? Yeah, so he, he had his memories restored by okay. by the um, brainwave scanner, but we don't know exactly what that restore point was, so there may be some gaps in his okay. memory which uh, are as yet undefined. So I say anybody who shushes snake eyes deserves a knock in the mouth. I'm sure, (laughs) like to me, like he has a tremendous amount of stuff to say. I'm sure that from those years that he couldn't speak, there were things he probably wanted to express. Like Mm -hmm. to me, like you can't expect someone who has undergone a trauma and then been reborn to be the same person he was before. (laughs) You know, like to me, uh, like I, I agree with you. I would love to hear what Scarlet thinks of this, you know? So has she only been, were were they together before he was reborn? Yes. Yes. They were together from before the um, G.I. Joe team was formed. So like in the chronology pre-1982. That's astounding. But, But to Tim's point. Like this issue reads like they've had many conversations well, I'm already. I'm sure that they have. Like hmm. so, to me, like um, I can't remember who said it. Who said if it? If she's but, let him, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? No, that's exactly right. And um, was it was it you, Mark, who pointed out that they were sleeping back to back? Yeah. And, and how that that can be like a like a symbol of like they're not necessarily look that they're not necessarily coming at their relationship from the same direction like you know when somebody can't express themselves all of the time i'm sure she was projecting a lot of what she thought that snake eyes was thinking on him and and i wonder if she feels now disillusioned now that he can express himself more clearly oh that's don't you want to do a counseling session on them yes i do i tremendously do because like um, I'm sure, like, they were, I'm guessing that they were sleeping back to back because they were actually just sleeping, you know? And so, so like, it's not like Brad and I, when we sleep, we're always facing the exact same direction. Um. <laughs> that is correct. Lisa is a wild sleeper. <laughs> I, I'd be thrashing. She's I've all got over demons. the mattress. <laughs> Sometimes oh, wow. she's not so, on the mattress. So, like, um, <laughs> so, so. Levitating a couple of feet yeah, above. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't necessarily like read too much into them not facing the same direction, but I, like I, I imagine that they're in a cabin together. They're extremely isolated. I'm sure that they're talking all of the but time, at, or I like, hope that they are. In these three issues, every time you see Snake Eyes and Scarlet together, it's like and it, it's like okay, this is a moment. This is a moment. And we're craving more, right? And we're getting like a pleasure delay regarding their relationship. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I I I imagine that Snake Eyes is going under a lot of like like self deprogramming and going like I do have a tremendous amount to say. And and anybody who doesn't let him speak, knock in the mouth, knock in the mouth, <laughs> knock in the mouth. What, what, a comparison that I often make is GI Joe to Uncanny X Men, the this Chris Claremont run, because there are so many interesting parallels mm-hmm. and. 
and and to some extent the like extended chris claremont run you know like the scott lovedell run that comes after it um but you know every every 20 or 50 issues of x-men there's like half an issue there's like christmas or a baseball game mm-hmm. or they go into town and they go to that bar that rest that bar that always gets destroyed right and because the happy harry's or something like um i don't remember but we we can figure it out <laughs> but sometimes it's sort of the issue after a big story or a crossover and it's like a breath or a pause and you you just get some sort of character flavor and some conversation while they you know play baseball or like have a beer and gi joe does not do that mm. i'm thinking about this panel with um because i'm looking at the one of them where they're in bed together and, and scarlet with the red hair there as well i'm thinking about like the x-men relationship with um scott and gene as well particularly because you guys have been talking about that so much and it's like that kind of iconic established solid relationship for for such an enormous amount of time until it isn't but you know snake eyes and scarlet in the in the comics they've they've been a duo pretty much you know i'd say on and off but pretty much on apart from when he's died (laughs) (laughs) when they, they had a break for that it's that that kind of iconic relationship where I guess there's a there's an enormous you know weight on it. Did Scarlet was Scarlet with anybody else while he was dead? I think she well she this is an interesting thing she had I think some complicated feelings mm. because while he was dead they came they had a replacement Snake Eyes who was a different person but suffered a similar trauma where he he lo- lost the ability to he had you know d- damaged his face and he lost the ability to to speak and that's really and then, just her type like that's what yeah she likes and, in a and then he dressed up and then he dressed up as snake eyes uh because they wanted to trick cobra into thinking that snake eyes was still alive and gi joe was less vulnerable and and then uh there was dawn which is the kind of female snake eyes and she was this you know high school kid um who had snake eyes memories downloaded loaded into her to uh to it her so there was these two snake eyes one of whom was like physically similar to snake eyes and had the, the training and dressed like snake eyes and the other who's a, a, a girl who's got all of his memories dawn had some funny feelings towards scarlet because of those memories inside of her brain where she's got all of this you know feeling towards snake eyes and Sc- scarlet seemed to have some complicated feelings towards throwdown sean because um because of that kind of physicality oh my similarity. god i would read the hell out of that book like, if I knew that that's what was happening in G.I. Joe's, I would have invested way sooner. Then again, like, I am a melodramatic reader. Like, that is what I come to comics for. I'm way more X-Men than I am G.I. Joe. But, like, I don't know. That Like, that's but, fascinating. <laughs> but we get, like, one panel of that every few <laughs> issues, and then the rest and of it that's... is chop- chopping up cyborgs. <laughs> so, Also, in X-Men and in Avengers – there are other relationships bet- besides sort of the one well-known one, uh-huh. you know, besides Scott and Jean, there's Rogue and Gambit and, you know, yeah. Storm and Forge or Storm and Wolverine later on in the Jason Aaron run. Wolverine um, and everyone. <laughs> yeah. Daddy dog. Um, you know, Hawkeye has been married to like three Avengers. In G.I. Joe, you have Snake Eyes and Scarlet and then... You know, we sort of checked in like four or five times with Flint and Lady J. Destro and the Baroness are an item. That's about it. Uh-huh. Okay. So the that some some characters have romantic lives outside of the book or within other within the book with other characters, other marquee characters. Uh it is not a big component of G.I. Joe. It's it is a it is a secondary uh mm-hmm. component. I wanted to ask Mark a question. Um, when the three uh, Cobras are sneaking up on the pit in Utah, they identify it as Camp Greer. Mm. And I'm trying to remember, does, some, does anyone call it Camp Greer before that in the issue? Is this the first time? Yeah, I think it's I think it's pop, sort of surfaced here, there. Um, on a, on occasion, I don't think this is the first. It is called Camp time. Greer in this issue because I have yeah, that yeah, written yeah. down in my notes. Okay, but I was wondering. So we, we all call it the pit. The pit is the underground complex that's below this um, modest, you know, like there's like one watchtower and like three Quonset huts and maybe a couple other like uh, sheds and and this is what 
uh, spirit is is guarding. We call it the pit, even though that refers to the thing that's under it. Mm. But I thought, wait, Camp Greer is that is that the first time it's been named? Yeah, I don't think and, I couldn't I couldn't tell you with precision when it's been used before, but I don't think it's the first time. Okay. But they sort of it, it clarifies a little bit, I guess, the terminology that Camp Greer is kind of the public facing name. Of yes. this is the camp that sits on top. The pit is below. I spy with my little eye. I had a couple of ice sky spies of little details we've not talked about so far. There's a letter from Mark in London, UK, in the letter page, which I will just for the record state is not me. <laughs> Outrageously, there is another G.I. Joe fan called Mark. Uh, who's in the UK, who has written in like I did. So I was very disappointed uh, <laughs> that it was a different mark and not me in the letter page. But I will keep on trying. The, I did notice there was this uh, ninja formation where uh, one gets on piggyback on the other so that they, he can kind of use his shoulders as an elevated shooting position, it looked like. And that just put me in mind of um, the Scorpion formation from issue 134, where uh, a bunch of red ninjas all climbed up on one another's shoulders to create a kind of giant scorpion, which is, of course, the best way to fight other ninjas. Uh, were there any other little details that, that you guys had noticed that you wanted to call out? One of Don's parents is a plumber. <laughs> yeah, true. Because there's a, there's a the van. van, yeah. There's a van parked uh marino plumbing also don's dad has a pistol oh i did not notice that which it isn't a big deal but you know we ha we haven't seen a lot of uh civilians at home in gi joe comics who are sort of unrelated to the joes or you know sort of family members of them you know we've seen a couple and i, I it sort of me it, it it jumped out at me because Oh, this guy lives in the Cobra town. Mm. And everyone who lives in the Cobra town is either a Cobra soldier living sort of in their civilian clothes and their uniform is in the closet, or they're like a true believer and some kind of, you know, it's like, I moved here. I'm not a, I'm not a militant, but I believe in it. Or they've been brainwashed. But I thought, oh, he's, he's got a gun. Yeah. And I will fix those terrorist plumbing. <laughs> he says, uh, Don says that um, she knows that her parents had a rough time because of what she did. So it, could the gun be in relationship to that? Did she endanger her family in some way? Hmm. Um, I thought it was sort of more, well, it could either be emotional because she disappeared and became a Joe. It might also be that, you know, Cobra Commander interrogated them because their kid defected. Mm. Mm, yeah, the uh, rubber hoses and the telephone book. Um, <laughs> uh, I didn't have any eye spies or error detected. It's a Larry Hammer colloquialism. He's talking G.I. Joe and all its heroism. Can you guess what it is? Is it something new? Now listen as Larry drops a slice of real life on you. Did have a colloquial, two colloquialisms to, to call out. The first one was the Galen 2000 self-contained autonomous surgical bot. Now, class... Uh, who can tell me who Galen of Pergamon was? I think I think Mark can. <laughs> <laughs> he was a Roman Greek physician, surgeon, and philosopher, uh, considered to be one of the most accomplished of all medical researchers of antiquity, and sometimes called the father of modern medicine. So uh, that's the the link to a surgical bot uh, naming convention. My other one of a of a good ten dollar word was. Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to trip over this one. Ver, verisimilitude, mm. which is, yeah, great. Uh, I would add it to my vocabulary if I could pronounce it properly. And that uh, is the appearance of being true or real. So that this is where um, Alpha001 says, uh, when questioned about whether the machine can make the Vipers pass for human, it says, they say, you will be amazed by the ver verisimilitude, creating that uh, altered lifelike shell. 
I did also clock that word because I love the word verisimilitude. And like, I love it because usually it's being used kind of like metaphorically. But in this case, it's being used very literally. Like, Mm -hmm. this is going to look like a real person. Very impressive. Postbox bit, postbox bit. This is where you can send in your thoughts. Mark and Tim will hear it And then we'll discuss it It's really nice to hear from our biggest fans Before we wrap up, we had uh, a uh, listener contribution So let's hear what Scotty Cameron had to say to us Who, funnily enough, does have a letter in this month's issue Yo, Joe Hello, Mark and Tim Got the double feature today of Aaron Cobra Commander. Gotta say, I love both comics. We get an alliance forged between Serpentor Khan and Alpha 001. More Snake Eyes speaking. But now, does it look like those Ravon's robots shut him up for good? Also, the letters page. I know Tim's gonna be happy. And I'm in the letters page. So are you, Mark. Now you know. And knowing is half the battle. Uh, So thank you, Scotty, for uh, that little voicemail, as always. So before we wrap up, let's let's give it a score, and specifically, Lisa, as a brand new reader, with 303 being your first issue in, I'd be interested to see what your appetite is for reading issue 304 uh, and beyond. So before we had our our conversation, I would say that my interest in, like, if, uh, my, okay, I would say a five out of 10, like a five out of 10, like I could take or leave continuing to read G.I. Joe, even though I did really enjoy this issue, I enjoyed the art in particular, but I, like, I wasn't feeling particularly invested until I found out that Scarlet is now in a relationship with the clone of her dead boyfriend. Like, now I'm in. Now I'm a 10 out of 10. I'm so curious. I would like to read more. But but then you said, well, you're barely, you're going to get this in like one or two issues. And then that bumped me down to a seven. So now I'm a seven out of 10 interested in continuing. Excellent stuff. And um, I guess as a, as a, Context for for that you rated Duke very highly. Was that almost a ten out of ten or? A so that's nine a ten. Out of 10? I'm de- I'm still yeah. I'm definitely going to continue reading it. But like they they're in this instance one we're start like GI Joe doesn't exist yet. Like Duke one is like like let's have a let's start let's 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 yeah. go right. So his his a intentions are really clear. Like there are Transformers. That's terrifying. You know what I mean? Like, so, like, I understand where he's coming from. Where I just, I just don't understand where any of the people are coming from. Don't you feel like, here's my question to you. Like, you're, you're, you were already a big fan of Joshua Williamson and Tom Riley before reading Duke number one. Mm -hmm. And the style of both the writing and the art is very Lisa. Right. Whereas the style of a real American hero right now is you know it's very larry hama it, it, it's of an older school right right and like, not necessarily your bag yeah i talk a lot about when it comes to liking or not liking stories like i talk a lot about priorities and i feel like even though uh larry hama says that he comes from like this deeply character place i feel like his avoidance of melodrama it kind of like and the fact that that is his very last priority like makes the story maybe not for me. And this issue, I would say, even compared to the last two issues, is very plotty plot plot plot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I would, I would feel terrible trying to judge. <laughs> like, like clearly, I can't judge all of Larry Hama's GI Joe based on this one story. That would be completely unfair, inappropriate, inappropriate. Mm. Brad, do you want to go next? I'm loving it. I'm having a great time with G.I. Joe. Uh, is this my favorite issue of the three issues we've gotten so far from Skybound? 
Probably not. Uh, I was so excited off of uh, 301. Um, and, and this is propelling the narrative forward. And I'm curious. And the the whole, like, I didn't even know about the clone snake eyes thing until you guys said clone snake eyes on this podcast. <laughs> so I have a, a lot more questions about what has been going on. But that does answer a few that I had based on, like, why is snake eyes now just so chatty Cathy in this issue? Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I like I had I had a really good time with this specific chapter. I'm gonna give it an eight out of ten. I'm definitely continuing, uh, and I'm excited to see where it goes and how the whole, you know, Serpentor zombie gang goes. I'll go up next. I really like the the art still. It's got a lot of punch to it, uh, though though with um Tim's Tim's observations, I, I am sort of seeing some of the patterns in in the repetition of of some of the 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 art. I really enjoyed 301, really enjoyed 302. Um, I, I've t- spoken before about the the sort of the danger of reading comics monthly is that um, when you've got like a trade paperback or you're going through a stack of issues that have built up over time, if you get a, a bit of a bum issue or one that you don't enjoy quite as much, it's fine because you just move on to the next one. Whereas in when you're reading in real time, you've got a, a, a month to to kind of wait to see if it goes in a bit more of a direction that you are hoping for or how things are going to resolve, if certain points are going to be picked up or just abandoned, all of these kind of things. So so this was a bit of a transition issue again and and sort of the, the resurfacing of the Blue Ninjas sort of picked up a, a plot point that I feel like I kind of had my fill of from, from the IDW issue. So... Uh, on, on that basis, it's it's an issue that I enjoyed less, but you know, still overall enjoyed. Still very much super looking forward to to the next issue and seeing how how this does all pro- progress. Um, so probably overall about a seven, I'd say. Okay. I was disappointed by this issue uh, for the mostly for the storytelling uh, reasons. I also did find it to be more of a transition issue and some gi joe larry hama issues are you know the way that he layers his like a plot and b plot and c plot some of them stuff is coming to a head or some of them the a plot and the b plot are like really heating up and sometimes they sort of all feel uh more even maybe this is what brad was just saying a moment ago like plotty plot plot (laughs) Um, and um uh, and 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 I, I say, same with Mark about um, I, I, I'm interested in the Blue Ninjas coming back or being a part of the Skybound run, where Hama would do something new with, with them. I don't see it yet. Uh, so, but the color on this book is still gorgeous. I haven't I haven't talked about the color at all in this episode of Talking Joe, and um, I am still really thrilled by uh, uh, Francesco Sagala's work on this but i give this a five i just thought to myself imagine if the next issue was an all silent funeral for scarlet and snake eyes wow. um, <laughs> that that would be a hell of a twist we'll find out when we talk about it on uh, in talking joe in a month's time when we tackle uh, gi joe a real american hero 304 which is on the 21st of february that's uh, my birthday the sky when the skybound era of ARA continues uh, we'll also be looking at cobra commander deep dive very soon i'm really looking forward to talking about that with tim and seeing what uh he makes of it because i know what i make of it already um and, and, and for for those of you who read gi joe 303 as a physical object in your book it had the four mm-hmm. page cobra commander one preview in the back and worth saying actually that um the cobra commander one came out the same uh week as uh, this issue so we had a difficult decision to make about uh, what to cover first but uh you know our hearts do lie first and foremost with the a real american hero storyline that we've been following for the best part of 40 years and in between we're you know all sorts of fun interviews looking back on the devil's due era will come up Brad and Lisa, our listeners, go and check them out and seek out the Energon Universe coverage that exists already. There was a a magnificent interview with the Duke team where you uh, really pulled out some interesting 
points uh, from the creative team there. So that's uh, well worth a listen. But um, yeah, do you want to just tell us uh, where people can find you and uh, all of that kind of good stuff? Yeah, you can find us at comicbookcouplescounseling.com. We're on all the podcast apps. We did have that conversation with Joshua Williamson and Tom Riley about Duke. We've also had Robert Kirkman on uh, talking about Void Rivals and Daniel Warren Johnson talking about Transformers. Uh, We've been covering a lot of the Energon universe. Uh, But right now we're just starting a new counseling session series of episodes. We're doing four episodes exploring the the relationship between Scott Summers and Emma Frost, hashtag Schema. And Mm -hmm. I'm very excited to uh, delve into that very complicated romance. And we have an episode with Todd McFarlane coming up here in a couple weeks as well. So please be on the lookout for that. Uh, I'm dubbing that uh, Life Lessons with Todd McFarland, yeah. even though he would reject that title. Uh, but there's a lot to, to, to take from that conversation. We spoke to him for over an hour, and it was an absolute You spoke blast. to him for an over an hour? <laughs> yeah. Well, he spoke to us. We got some words in. They were I, edgewise. I, I, I'm going to put it out here. We've had four conversations now with Todd McFarland. Oh, wow. And the second conversation we had with him was all about his anti-religious just views right and i feel like that's one of the most unique todd mcfarland conversations out there not to like toot our own horn but i love tooting my own horn uh <laughs> and i think this conversation while some of it may be familiar to longtime mcfarland fans i think there's some new stuff there too and i'm just excited to get it out into the world that's excellent. I think if anyone enjoys talking to Joe um, that and has a wider interest in in comics, you know your podcast is definitely something that that would appeal because, um, like us, you you really enjoy getting into the weeds and and yeah. get not afraid to to take a little bit of time to explore and pull apart a page or a panel uh, with some uh, some detail. That's so kind. Thank you. Uh, your exploration of the the Scott and uh, Emma relationship has uh, sort of made for some very interesting uh, listening. Um, Tim, can you remind us where people can find you when you're not talking to me about all things G.I. Joe? Video essays on TV and film at our YouTube page, Atomic Abe, uh, my brick and mortar comic book store in Somerville, Massachusetts is Hub Comics. And I write about G.I. Joe at A Real American Book. Very good. And if you are new to Talking Joe, just a reminder, you can find us on the usual places. Talkingjoe.co.uk is the website that has links to all of those places. Facebook, Twitter, I won't say X. Uh, Instagram, email, voicemail. We're also over on Patreon, patreon.com slash Talking Joe. And you can be one of the cool kids like Richard, Sam, Jay, Bill, Christopher, Justin, Rob, Brian, Shane, and Ryan, who are all getting early access to episodes and some exclusive content. So I think that just remains for us to say thank you so much to Brad and Lisa for joining us. And, uh, Good to get uh, a new take on uh, on this particular issue and certainly prompted some discussions that I don't think would have arisen otherwise. So uh, great to have you on. Oh, Our pleasure. You. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us. And uh, that is us done. But until next time, remember that... Nobody beats Talking Joe, an international podcast! Laters. You've got pipes. That sounded great. The singing. Thanks. That's the that's a a, a jingle from the ads from '89. Uh, the nobody beats GI Joe. Yeah, but it's yeah, yeah, yeah. a real American hero. <laughs> you have a lovely voice. What a lovely singing Thanks. voice. Thanks. Now I've been recording parody songs to kind of start each episode based on the contents of the issue. Uh, for the last, I don't know, ten ish, ten episodes or so, yeah, uh, we... ten monthly ones, <laughs> which um, <laughs> which have a little a lot of heart to them, but not necessarily a lot of tune. Or they have a lot of character. Them. I found it very sweet. <laughs> Thank you. No one works harder on a GI Joe podcast <laughs> than Mark. Oh, that's very sweet. I love hearing words of affirmation between partners. That's beautiful.